Thank you for coming. I'm glad of your interest on, on this topic. Um, so, yeah, I'm Ricardo Corral. Ricardo Corral. Um, I'm studying a PhD on biochemical sciences at the National University of Mexico. Um, so, what I'm going to show you is part of my, my research. Uh, I'm also a lead data scientist at Suggestic. Um, in this company, we try to improve people's health by suggesting um, dietetic and lifestyle plants uh, based um, with machine learning technologies mainly. Okay. Well, first, uh, what are proteins? Um, proteins are the most abundant uh, kind of micromolecules uh, in cells. Um, they are responsible of life itself, as we know it, because um, they perform a large range of activities. Um, these activities of proteins are due mainly to the protein structure. And that's why it's important to, to study protein structure. Um, information about the protein composition is encoded in the DNA. Um, DNA is transcribed to RNA, and finally, we have a sequence of amino acids. Um, Every protein is made up of these 20 amino acids, uh, a single sequence, and uh, they fold by many biochemical, physical chemical properties of the amino acids. So what we got uh, in a protein is something like this. Uh, it's a very big uh, molecule. It has a lot of atoms. And it's pretty difficult to see any kind of pattern here. So biochemists uh, like to draw proteins this way. Um, amino acids tend to have two kinds of local interactions. These are called uh, alpha helixes, like this. And beta sheets like these other guys. Um, these elements are called secondary structure. Um, I forgot to set, tell. The main amino acid sequence is called also primary sequence. Okay? These local arrangements are called secondary structure, and the global structure of the protein in, in three-dimensional space is uh, uh, tertiary structure. OK, so there's, um, there are many uh, folds, many kind of structures that protein can, uh, can have. Um, this is uh, a first attempt to try to represent what is called the false space. False space is like a conceptual framework uh, where you can put any idea about protein structure or function or evolution. Uh, for example, if you want to say that two protein structures are very similar, you can say that uh, they are close in this whole space. Uh, you can reconstruct uh, uh, this whole space by comparing each pair of proteins in your data set, and then try, try to assign a particular position um, in order to maintain these, these distances. Uh, the problem with this approach is that there are as many false space representations are as data sets. So what we need is a way to obtain this position in full space given only the protein structure, only the structural features, without knowing any, anything about other structures. 
um, another way of representing a protein structure is by its contact map. A contact map is a representation of the contacts between every pair of residues. Uh, sorry. Amino acids are called residues if they are inside a protein. Okay, if I say, say residues, I mean an amino acid inside a protein. So when two residues are near each other, they are in contact. Um, um, so you can have a graph uh, where each vertex is a residue and each edge um, represents that those residues are in contact, are, are close in, in the structure. Um, and a residue cluster is like a generalization of this concept. Um, so you can have more than two residues in contact if all of the, them are uh, in contact with each other. So for example, here we have um, three clusters. Okay, that uh, this is equivalent to cliques, maximal cliques that are complete subgraphs of the contact map. Okay, and for example, uh, yeah, here we have also four cliques of size three but uh, they are not taken into account, and that's the Sperner property. No cluster is inside another cluster, so we are considering on only the, bigger, the biggest uh, clusters possible. Um, and it's interesting this relationship between the size of the protein, that is the number, the total number of amino acids, and versus the total number of clusters. Um, it is very regular among any kind of proteins. Uh, so counting total number of clusters cannot be a descript descriptor for, for protein structure. But if we distinguish uh, the clusters by how residues are in primary sequence, we, for example, have all of these are examples of clusters of size 4, uh, but they are different because the contiguity in primary sequence uh, is distinct. Um, this is a simplified uh, example of how a, a protein looks like in three-dimensional space. Uh, here, if each four of these um, residues are said to be in contact, they form a, a cluster. So the total number of cl clusters is, um, is the same if these paths were very different. But if we count how many times are these kind of clusters, these countings uh, becomes a good descriptor of, um, of all of these form, of the shape of, of, of the trajectory. So this is idea of um, getting, uh, of counting classes of clusters in, in proteins. So it is possible to describe the entire shape of the protein only counting how many times each class of residual clusters are. Um, in proteins, there are 26 descriptors because um, the maximum size of clusters is six, the minimum size is three, and if you, if you take into account all these variations of the same um, cluster, you end up with 26. Okay, so we have a, a lot of 
atomic positions. Okay, and uh, we end up with a single point in 26 dimensions that represents all that complexity. Okay. Uh, and the position in, the, in this 26 dimensional space uh, is determined by the structural features of, of the protein. Okay, there are two main uh, structural classifications uh, database, databases, and these are hierarchical. Uh, first level of classification, uh, the C level, has to be with the class, which means um, the secondary structure content. So we have um, all the proteins that have mainly alpha helixes, and we have proteins with beta sheets only, and we have a com combination of both. And then a further classification is made accordingly to the overall shape of the, the protein um, without taking into account very fine details. And in the last level of classification, we have the topology, which is very sensitive to, to difference and, and similarities. Um, well, this is how uh, our representation of false space looks like. Uh, each color represents um, its class as is given by, by CAT, by, by this database. Um, well, it's clear to see that uh, proteins belonging to the same classification uh, are in a defined region in, in this space, and, and that's very good. Uh, we made a statistical test of how well this representation of false space uh, splits different uh, classes. Um, I'm not going into the details here, uh, but it reduces to an hypothesis testing. And the result uh, was that this representation indeed is separable by, by, by the classification scheme given by this database. So when learning the, the classifications given this representation, uh, these are the accuracies doing cross-validation with uh, 10 iterations. Um, it's pretty cool and it's very stable uh, between the faults. And we made this experiment uh, of training and testing over the same data set. It is not recommended if you want to evaluate the, your capacity to predict new samples. But in this case, uh, these um, examples that cannot be correctly classified, um, even if they were shown to the classifier in the training set, means that the complexity of the model is not enough to discriminate these poor examples. That means, for example, that there are many elements, many proteins of under the same class, and there are just one element that is assigned to another class, but uh, it's like if these examples, for, for say something, they are very difficult because they are in a region uh, by class green, but officially they belong to the class magenta. And how these ex examples look like is something like this. Uh, you can see in, 
here there are elements of secondary structure being alpha helix and beta sheets and so our classifier classifiers say it is actually alpha and beta but officially this should be a mainly beta which is at least uh, it's not so accurate uh, this example uh, is classified for by our classifier as being mainly beta but officially in CAT this should be alpha and beta this thing uh, is classified as has few secondary structure but officially it is mainly beta and this one which is classified as um, as mainly alpha should be a few secondary structure so we have a way to identify very hard uh, assignments of classifications of, of the structures by uh, by doing this this experiment of training and testing over over the same data set so we can replicate some given structural classification and uh, there's another similar uh, problem that is a protein structural neighbor retrieval um, the setup of the problem is uh, if you if we have a protein structure and a new protein structure and a database with protein structures what are the proteins more similar to the uh, query protein and um, it's very difficult because usually you need to compare the similarity between two protein structures you try to superimpose one over the other um, this is computationally expensive and it's not so accurate at, at all for example these two, two proteins have a very high um, score when they are aligned because all this part aligns perfectly with this uh, segment and so the score when you compare the structures is very high but it does not reflect the similarity you are looking for so you have two criteria um, okay let's define this this classes are SAS is a, a score for uh, structural superposition and um, SAS 20 means that this score is less than two angstroms the, from one structure to the other um, this should be less than 3 or 5 and this should be less than 5 so this is very restrict restrictive while this is more relaxed and these are classifications um, as given by scope that the other database that is not cut to structural classification and it's interesting that here we have the fraction of pairs of proteins that are under this level of similarity that belongs to the same classification um, at family, superfamily, topology and class. So what it's expected is that this fraction is very close to one because you call identify members of the same class by just doing comparisons but it's not the case you have a very tiny fraction of of members of same class that can be identified only by this score okay so 
doing structural alignment is not enough to know when two structures belong to the same class. Um, so state of the art for this problem is um, contact leaf. They measure the capacity of identify structural neighbors by sorting by some criteria of similarity and, and they see how, how well ranked uh, are the pairs of proteins that belong to the same uh, class. For this problem, a real structural neighbor is um, Okay, two proteins are real neighbors if they are under, under this criteria of, of uh, structural superposition and also are inside the same superfamily. You need to meet both criteria to say that two structures are really uh, neighbors. Uh, these are our results. Oh. Uh, compared directly with contact lip, we are a little, uh, well, it's almost the same at this level. We perform a little better on the next levels. Uh, and the way of doing this is given a query structure, we can predict its classification and then the score of the neighbor is how much the classifier thinks the other structures belong to the predicted class. Um, um, and so you can check this, um, this link. This is how the protein structure uh, information is uh, stored. It has a lot of uh, data, but the most important part is, is this. Here you have each of the atoms that uh, has the protein, and you have coordinates in X, J, and Z. And so the idea is, uh, as I told you, how to transform all of these coordinates in a single point. And in practice, <laughs> the only you need to do is to create uh, an object with the file uh, in PDB format, that is the format I, I showed you, and a particular chain. Proteins may be made or of more than one chain, so you need to specify what chain you are interested in. Um, this vector is computed as, um, at construction time, so you can see the result in this variable. Um, it's, it doesn't take so much. Um, so you can download all the domain definitions of these databases, CAT and SCOP. Um, and I have this pre-computed database. You have a, the domain ID, the 26 dimensional vector, and the classification under this uh, database. So, you can use scikit-learn to do a lot of magic with this. Uh, first thing we can do is um, reduce the dimensionality of this space to try to see how the structure is. You can see, make a plot of every pair of, of, uh, of variables, but it is better to try to compact all of this information in the number of dimensions you want. So here I'm using isomap. 
and plotting the, the results with this data set looks something like this. It's very similar to the image I uh, we see before. This is a compact uh, data set in order to make these computations um, more quickly. Uh, then this is an adaptation of the Elinas tutorial uh, first day. You can make some um, hyperparameter uh, selection with this um, and plot the combination of uh, parameters that are more suitable. And you can use uh, also this other function to, to calculate the cross-validation, the cross-validated score. Scikit-learn have a function to calculate this, but you miss all of the details in each iteration, so you can use this, um, this function to see all the details in each iteration. Uh, so you can play a little trying to improve this, these accuracies. Uh, here are some of the formal details. Uh, they are not so funny at all. So, mm. there are still so many databases that uh, have information about protein structures. And the idea is that you can try to learn any kind of classifications with this same uh, structural representation. Um, we can do all of this if we already have the protein structure. I mean, the positions of each atom in the three-dimensional space. But a big problem in computational biology is to determine, to predict the structure given only the sequence. So there's a, an international experiment called CASP. So they have uh, new proteins, they know the structure, but they only open the, the sequence. So any research group can make their predictions and see who can do the work better. And this is very interesting. This is a, an image from a last review of the uh, advances of this experiment. And what you are seeing here is each point is the best uh, research group that predicts the protein structure. And here you have a score of similarity between the, the model, the, the prediction, and the real structure. And this target difficulty is how similar is the query structure, the, the query sequence, with known sequences. So, um, when predicting protein structure, um, a lot of uh, approaches uh, make use of sequence similarity. If you know sequences that are very similar to the sequence of interest, it's very easy to, to predict the structure. But uh, it's very difficult when you query sequence have no, has no direct uh, similarity with sequences you know. So this target difficulty tries to summarize uh, this effect. So it is more difficult if the more similar sequence we know is not so similar at all. Um, it's pretty sad that uh, 
this tendency hasn't changed since almost 20 years because all of the approaches still rely in having direct similarity. And so what we can do is not trying to predict directly the structure, but the representation of the structure. So if you can have a attributes to represent a protein sequence, you can map this sequence to the corresponding vector in the 26 dim dimensional space. Um, I'm not going into the, the details of how these attributes for protein sequence are generated, but the idea is once you have uh, your attributes from a sequence, you can learn for every of the 26 numbers of the um, structural fold space. Um, and then you retrain your classifier in this predicted space. So you have your set of sequences, you have a set of known structures and their vectors, and you have classifications based on structure. So you can have a sequence, predict this representation uh, in 26 dimensions, and then replicate some structural classification. Um, and here is um, an experiment made on this topology. Tim Barrel is the most, is the biggest uh, family, structural family known. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of proteins that falls in the same manner, but there are a lot of sequence families very dissimilar with each other. So you have a group of sequences belonging to this, this topology, and uh, you have another group of sequences um, also belong, belonging to this topology, and have no so much uh, similarity with these with these groups. Um, so if we, if this approach works, um, and we can eliminate the necessity of having direct similar, uh, of di direct sequence similarity, uh, we should be able to predict a, a structural class for a f sequence family given no other example of that family to the training set. Um, each point here is represent a, a sequence family. All the elements uh, in this family are very similar uh, with each, each other. Uh, the idea is to train with all the available data except for, for this family. And then, uh, given this set of sequences, we predict their 26 dimensional vector, and over this space, we predict uh, the class. Um, we want to see if this class is indeed a team barrel. Um, An accuracy is how many of the members of this family were correctly assigned to this topology. And difficulty is, uh, as defined before, how, how close is the closest uh, known sequence. And uh, it's very interesting that um, we have good results in these cases when many other approaches just cannot make good predictions 
because there are no uh, similar sequences. Um, uh, I think it's all because I'm out of time also. <laughs> so, questions? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Ricardo. Um, okay. I'll admit one of, the, one of the reasons why I pegged for this to come in for PyData is I wanted to see how things have changed as someone who's, who's, uh, who's worked with doing protein folding before. Um, the strategies you've got now, you say that I mean, the, the, there really hasn't been a lot of change with getting better uh, accuracy with the classifiers. Um, just wanted to see then that some of the, the deep learning algorithms that you've, you've got pegged there, have you got any early data from doing those strategies? Um, you had that one graph about the Tim Barrel family. Mm -hmm. Have you tried for the other families? Is there any, yeah. is there some success in the other areas as well? I'm starting this experiment because the evaluation of one family takes from nine to 12 hours. Yeah. And there are more than 2,000 families, so I need more than two years. But I'm working on a distributed uh, environment so I can in parallel run all, all these experiments. And I hope to have all the families evaluated by two months or so. And yeah, any, other, any questions for Ricardo? I just wanted to revisit one thing. Um, I did slightly lose you on what the 26 uh, predictors were. Could you just uh, explain that part again? Uh, I think it's some sort residue peaks, but I wasn't. Yeah. Certain. The the class of the residue residue cluster is oh, is determined by sequence continuity. Okay. So, if you have, for example, clusters of size three. Three residues may be contiguous, or you can have two contiguous and one discontinuous, or all the three can be discontinuous. So for a cluster of size three, you only have three classes. Okay, for clusters of size four, you have more possible classes, and so on. So if you sum up all of the possibilities of classes of clusters, of size three to six, you got 26. Right, well I think in the interest of time, we'll call it there. Ricardo's around for the rest of the day if you have any more questions for him. But thank you very much, Ricardo, for your time. Thank you.